Hello, Dragon Con. Thank you for coming to watch. Uh, lively group already, I can tell. <laughs> um, so today we're talking about open source uh, and how that can leave you exposed to hackers and everything that could go wrong with using open source. Uh, just a little bit about me. So uh, I am a fellow at a company called Synopsys. Uh, we used to be White Hat Security and we got bought out by um, Synopsys. I've um, been doing AppSec for about 18 years, uh, specifically around web application security, so hacking websites. Uh, companies would come to us to hire our services, to hack their websites for them, and then we give them the results so they can go fix the problems before the bad guys do. So talking about open source, just out of curiosity, how many developers do we have here? All right, uh, how about maybe DevOpsy type people? DevOps, QA, people that just want to see stuff get hacked. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Uh, so looking at open source, um, the idea is that uh, it's source code. It's kind of obvious uh, where anybody can utilize it. Okay. Uh, the idea came out from around 1983. Uh, Richard Stallman, a programmer at MIT, uh, thought, hey, we should uh, why don't we make, start making software available for everybody to use, right? I don't need to make money off this necessarily, but here's a cool library that everyone is welcome to share and, and utilize it. Uh, so that's kind of where it got started. Today, the biggest resource for that is uh, GitHub. Uh, so GitHub is massive, owned by Microsoft now. So uh, usually most everybody's keeping the source code in GitHub, even enterprises. Um, you know, both personal uh, source code, vendor owned source code, as well as open source. So, why are we going to use open source? Uh, the big one is it's free. <laughs> why not, right? Um, it's flexible. Everybody can contribute to it. So, if I, if I put up some source code uh, that does something very simple, let's say it uh, maybe a calculator app or something that calculates uh, square footage. Someone can look at my code and say, you know what, you didn't do that very efficiently. I think there's a better way we can do it. And they could submit a pull request to say, hey, here's some code I modified. And I, as the owner, can look at it and say, yeah, it looks pretty good to me. I, that's great. Thank you so much. I approve. Boom. And now it ends up as the in the official repository so that anybody else that is sharing my square footage calculator now can use that code that's been improved by other people. Uh, of course, like I said, it's, it leaves room for things to get better. Um, it's a great learning opportunity. So if you want to figure out, hey, you know, I want to do this sort of project. I wonder what other people have done. How have they approached this problem? How, you know, maybe there's a solution that could get me in the right direction. Uh, so it, it's really nice just to be able to look at it and try to figure stuff out sometimes when you're trying to uh, tackle your own problems. One of the biggest uh, benefits for enterprises is it saves time, okay? So for instance, if there's a fairly large project, like we're gonna talk about one called uh, uh, Log4j, for instance, it's kind of the topic of this. Uh, it's an open source logging utility uh, for Java apps typically. And so there's a good bit of code there. It does a lots of things. It, it, you know, it writes log lines, you can format them, you can color them. Um, you can implement your code to say only log it if you do this. And it's a very handy open source tool and is used by so many corporations and personal people. I mean, anyone here use Log4j or know of it? You got a good handful. So it's definitely widely used. Um, and so, but if you went to your enterprise and your boss said, hey, you know what? I want to write a logging library. I think it'll take me about two months. And they're going to go, why are you doing that? There's this open source one that's available. Pull it down and you're done in a day, right? So that's one of the biggest benefits there, especially for corporations. Why is OSS risky? So one of the risks and uh, is around license types. And there are plenty of people here at EFF way more knowledgeable than I am when it comes to licensing for open source software, so I'm not really going to touch on that. But it's something that you need to be aware of. So um, if I pull an open source library and it does not have complete 
uh, freedom to use that. You know, a lot of the some of these licenses will be like you can use it, but if you use it in enterprise software, you need to pay me, right, or pay somebody. Um, so there's different license levels, and you have to be careful. You know, I've been uh, through several enterprises where we get audits, right, once a year. Hey, go through all your code, identify all your open source libraries, and make sure that we're not breaking any licensing because, you know, as HP or as Synopsys, they will come get us <laughs> and looking for money. Uh, so the other big risk is going to be vulnerabilities, okay? And so if there is a problem in one of those open source libraries, you uh, inadvertently, by including that source code into your project, now you are susceptible to those vulnerabilities. So one particular instance of that is by a malicious user. Hey, I'm a bad guy, and I know a lot of people use this open source library. So what I'm going to try to do is sneak in some code in there that is going to end up being a backdoor, let's say, to your enterprise or to your customers. Um, and they're going to use it that way. Or that when you install it and it gets installed on someone's computer, that it tries to download malware onto that machine, right? And again, when you're looking at open source, I said, hey, just include log4j. Done. I didn't go look at the code, right? I can because it's open source, but the number of developers that actually go through and look at those popular libraries you're not going to go and read every line of code and try to figure out, you know, is it safe or what is it doing? Uh, typically, you don't. Um, and uh, just a recent article here that uh, they found 26 open source projects on GitHub that had been uh, maliciously altered uh, to try to introduce vulnerabilities in applications that utilize those open source libraries. Um, so this does happen. Uh, most definitely. Uh, this type of attack uh, is referred to as a supply chain attack. The idea, you know, if you think of any supply chain, like in food, right? Like, hey, something got uh, salmonella in lettuce, or I, I'm not big on food. We have a scientist out here. He can tell us all about it. Uh, but um, he, if that gets infected, then they send that to the Kroger distribution centers, Publix, then people come and buy that, right? And if that that bad lettuce goes to all sorts of people and you got to track that down. Same for open source software where I included this library that came from another place. Somebody poisoned it, you know, at the origin and now I'm susceptible. So that's the concept of where supply, uh, supply chain attacks came from. A big example of this is the SolarWinds hack from late last year. This was huge because has because it hit a lot of our governments, uh, you know, a lot of our government organizations. Uh, SolarWinds is a software package uh, that gets used by, you know, lots of customers. Uh, there was about 18,000 customers that got affected by this. The interesting way they did this, though, this, this example was not open source, but it kind of shows how a supply chain attack works. A bad person, a malicious actor, was able to gain access to uh, SolarWinds source code repository. Once they got access to that, they were able to write a script. If, if you're, we have some DevOps people here, the, uh, a CI/CD pipeline, what it does is it controls how your application gets built. It says, hey, pull in this library, do this, do that, bundle it up, and now ship it. And what they did is they had a, some lines of code in there that said, hey, before you bundle it up, pull this bad piece of software and put, put it in the pipeline and bundle that up instead of the code that we actually wrote. <laughs> and what that did then is it went to their update server where all of the customers, you know, everyone uses software. Hey, click up. There's an update available. Do you want it? Well, of course I do. I, I want the latest updates. And what it did was downloaded the malicious software now where it actually uh, created a back door into the networks. Uh, and a command and control server where anybody could connect to those servers now and just you're inside the network. You can do whatever you want. Um, and so that kind of shows that example of a supply chain attack. The interesting thing here that, that made me think about it a little bit differently is, you know, the attacker could have attacked SolarWinds. Hey, I want to find out credit card numbers. I want to find out all this information about SolarWinds. But they thought, no, 
why don't I affect their software where now I can infiltrate 18,000 people and they're distributing it for me. <laughs> I only have to infiltrate one company and then they're going to open the door to 18,000 other companies. And that was kind of a kind of a weird play on how that worked. I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, and example, uh, open source bugs. So this is kind of more of the focus of what we're looking at when mistakes cause these issues. Uh, several years ago, there was something called Heartbleed. Uh, raise of hands. Anyone familiar with the Heartbleed vulnerability? So uh, what this was was a vulnerability in the open SSL library. So this is when you go to a website, HTTPS, dragoncon.com, it is secure because it's using SSL. Well, a lot of these companies were using the open source library uh, to supply that handshake where when your browser connects, it talks to each other, says, hey, is this site real? It is, right? Do they have a valid certificate? They do. Okay, let's connect. And so this was a simple a developer mistake. There was a buffer overrun error where if you supplied more information to that handshake that says, hey, are you, you know, is this legitimate? the backend server would actually process that extra information, okay? So what would happen is um, a, the functionality in the SSL server is called a heartbeat, which just sort of checks and says, hey, are you there? And what would happen is if you sent the malicious crafted handshake with the extra data that it wasn't expecting, it would actually dump the server's memory back to the user. And when you see it, it looks mostly like garbage, but if you start looking into it, you'll start seeing usernames and passwords of the last people that logged into that website. Um, and it was just happened to be in memory, right? So if you just keep hitting send, 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 and wait for that information to come back, you could start uh, scraping usernames and passwords for real users on whatever website that was using that OpenSSL library uh, with that vulnerability. This was a huge deal, you know, it, it's even hard to say how many sites were affected, but estimates are around a half a million to a million uh, websites that were affected because of that. And today, it is still a problem. There are sites out there that have not upgraded. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about what do we do about this. Any questions so far? Pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, so the next one, uh, log for shell So this is the big one. It came out um, earlier uh, this year, I believe. Uh, again, we were talking about Log4J. Most everyone that's a developer knows of it or has used it. There's, it's hard to even put a count on. It's in the millions. It's got to be of the websites and applications, actually, that utilize this. Interestingly enough, I say applications because this was discovered uh, by the Minecraft community. So Minecraft is, a, um, is written in Java, and they use Log4J in there. And all of a sudden, people who were server owners, Minecraft server owners, were seeing network traffic. They're like, what is going on here? That doesn't make any sense. What is this <laughs> going on that's coming into the server? And some bad people, you know, hackers, found out that this was a vulnerability and just started uh, attacking those servers. And we'll kind of show you what you can do. You'd be like, so what if they attack a, a Minecraft server? What's the big deal? And I'll show you why that is. Um, well, actually, I have a couple of those here. Essentially, you can own the server. It becomes your server at that point uh, with this particular vulnerability. And that's why this one was so bad. It was it is unadulterated ownership of, <laughs> of, the, of the machine, whatever server is running Log4J. Um, so... Uh, let's see. Yeah, so uh, that is how that came about. All right, so let's uh, satisfy the half of the group who just wants to see us hack stuff <laughs> and uh, and do some hacking. So that. And hopefully the demo gods are kind to me because I tried this earlier while listening to a Filk music band and nothing worked. So I had to try to put it all back together. Uh, not having internet affects so many things on your computer when it did work before. All right, so 
I'm going to bring up a web browser right here. So I've made my own DragonCon website, let's say. Uh, and here we are. So I can hit refresh. Wonderful. This is my server, my website. Okay. I happen to have used the vulnerable version of the open source uh, log for J on here. So it is vulnerable. I'm going to use a tool called Burp Suite. So pen testers, penetration testers, people in uh, security teams, they use this tool very commonly to find vulnerabilities in web applications. What we have up here is a request. And uh, I know this probably looks uh, foreign to many of you, but essentially when you use a web browser and you say www.dragoncon.com, go, this chunk of code is what actually the browser sends to the website. Uh, Chrome, Firefox, this is all hidden from you. You just typed in a URL. But ultimately what went to the website is a chunk like this. Pull this back. And there's certain things in here, like the host. What host are we hitting? Um, what's the user agent? We're using Mozilla, right? Or Firefox, or God forbid, Internet Explorer. So um, it tells the web server a lot of things. And the web servers oftentimes will log those things because the customer wants to know, hey, you know, what percentage of our customers are using Firefox? Or what percentage of our customers... Um, in this case, is using an API-specific version or something to that effect, okay? Um, and in this case, my vulnerable server is analyzing this API version, okay? You know, this might be something like v1, let's just say, and I'm going to hit send. So this is acting like a browser at this point. I just send it to the website. On this side, we can see we got a response. Hello, DragonCon. Great. That's sort of what's supposed to happen when I hit that website. Um, I can hit my dragon.html, which is the page that we were just looking at here. Dragon.html. So let's go back. Oops. I'll hit send. And we can see here's our image. Welcome to DragonCon. We can look at the render. So essentially that is the server that we're talking to, and we're getting these pages back. So now that I know that this server is vulnerable, okay, and there's tests of uh, the hackers, there's, there's tools now that you can download that are open source, they're on GitHub, <laughs> that will scan websites to tell you if it's vulnerable uh, to Log4j. So I know this one is vulnerable. So now what do we do with it? Something I may want to do uh, is, let's say, deface it, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over to this uh, decoder. I can issue my own commands now, which is what we talked about. log for shell basically says, hey, you can execute whatever you want on my server, have at it, <laughs> uh, because of the bad code that was written. And here I'm going to say echo. Uh, these are Linux commands. This particular server is running on Linux. So I'm going to say echo, which just means say it. Uh, and I put some HTML here. Um, a link says, click here for free tickets, uh, free tickets. And I want you to push it into dragon.html, okay? Um, the way this works is we're going to use base64 encoding. It makes things easier as far as escaping special characters. So I'm going to go back here. I want to make my API version. Oops, I need to grab another line here. All right, so here's our base64 encoding in this version. I'm going to take this. I'm going to. What just happened there? That, I need to recopy that. We'll plop that in there. Okay, and remember what this said, right? We're going to type in, uh, click here for free tickets. All right. So I'm going to go back to the root page. Now I'm going to send that. Here we go. Okay. I still got back. Welcome to DragonCon. But now if I go to my website, I hit refresh. Click here for free tickets. 
Now, raise a hand who thinks that you're going to get free tickets when you click on my link that I just pushed there. <laughs> you are not. You're going to either get malware, ransomware. I'm going to lock your machine just by visiting my website and clicking on free. And actually, this isn't my website. This is, Dra let's say, DragonCon's website, right? I'm not going to hack my own website. I'm going to take another enterprise and say, click here for free tickets, uh, which will redirect them to my site and download the malicious code, right, or own their machine. Uh, but what are some other cool things that we can do with this? Let's go back. Go back to our decoder. And what I want to do, uh, for those who are Linuxy, how about let's just try to issue an LS. So LS on Linux is like DIR, like show me a directory listing. Just when you're in Windows, right, you do DIR. Uh, all right, let's see what happens with that. And so I'm going to come down, put in my malicious code. Send there. Hello, DragonCon. Let's go look at our website now. And it didn't work. I knew the demo gods would get me. Uh, I am missing a quote. No, I'm not. Why didn't that one work? Did I leave it over there? Uh, let's see. Here's one I've created before. Let me grab that. Let's try that one. Send. Right, we're going to come back here and reload. Ah! Now the website is showing me the server's directory structure in that folder. And me as a hacker now, aha, fantastic. Let me go find the database directory and go see what's there, right? And look for interesting stuff. Um, let's go and. Uh, sure. Let's see what happens. Um, so what did I do? LS dash L. Boom. Did I do this one? I'm not sure why it didn't work. The... What's that? Oh, you have the echo from Is what? No, I need the echo. I need. Yeah, yeah, I kind of shouldn't need it, but let's see if this this works. Because this worked. All right, let's try it. Let me try it. Yeah, so uh, I think my examples had did have quotes, but we can do that. So you want parenthesis, dollar sign, right? Close. All right, let's see. Place your bets. I like when other people do my demos. <laughs> that way I know it works. All right, let's send it. And let us refresh again. No. What did I do here? I know one way we can figure it out. I can reverse this because I know this worked. Yeah, that's as zoomed in as I could. No echo. Oh, that's right. That's right. Because we're not actually doing that. All right. So let's go back again. And we're going to do. So we're going to do dash L. L A? LA. All right. Okay, let's see if this gets us. 
Ah, here we go. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to see that either normally. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, let's go. Um, how about we can also do uh, we can do a find dot. Let's try that. Send that and look at the website. Here is every single file that's on the server. <laughs> right, right. So uh, that kind of shows uh, just what we can do uh, with that and why this vulnerability was so bad. Um, once I'm on the server again, it becomes mine. I can do whatever I want with it. I can host malware from it. You know, I might put um, eh, some bad software on there, send an email to people and say, you know, bank, this is how bank phishing attacks work, right? To say, hey, click on this link, go check your account. You know, there's suspicious activity. Well, what it could do is actually point to what appears to be the real server, but actually you're gonna download a file that I put on the server. So um, there, there's all thing, kinds of things that you could do. Uh, in bad ways here. So let me jump back to the presentation. All right, so what do we do about this? How do we fix this? So uh, there's uh, three main methodologies to address this. One of them is called SCA, or Software Composition Analysis. Uh, the other big one that's kind of related is SBOM, Software Bill of Materials. And what this software does is you basically point it at your source code. And what it will do is look at all the libraries that you're using, all of the versions, and cross-reference that with known vulnerabilities that have been disclosed. And so it will tell you, hey, this log4j, you need to update it. It's critical. And we can tell just because of your source code that says, hey, I'm using this version of log4j. Uh, so it is very absolute. It's, it will tell you straight up if you need to update something. Uh, kind of two of the big players. One is Black Duck. I think that's probably one of the biggest ones. Uh, Sonatype is another one uh, as far as products that do this. The next one is called SAST, or Static Application Security Testing. So uh, this is very similar to SCA. The difference, though, is it's analyzing all of your source code. And this will find not just things that are, say, like open source issues, but just coding issues. Like a SAS scan would have identified the log4j issue. It would have said, hey, you're, you're not using sprintf, right? You're not. Uh, you didn't end how many characters you wanted to take in as a variable um, or a null pointer reference. It'll look at the code and identify bad things that you're doing that could lead to vulnerabilities. Um, and it will say things, hey, by doing this, you're going to make yourself vulnerable to SQL injection because you're taking user input and directly running a, a database query with it before any kind of filtering. Um, so SAS goes much deeper and will tell you about more vulnerabilities and things that you might be causing by using bad coding practices. Uh, a couple of the big ones here, uh, Coverity, uh, check marks is probably one of the biggest ones. One of the downsides with this though is always very language specific. So for instance, check marks, they may not support Golang or Coverity may not support C++. So Depending what language you're writing in, you have to find the right tool that supports those languages. Uh, so that's kind of a drawback uh, when it comes to SAST. And the last one is uh, DAST, and that's kind of where I, sh I specialize in. So dynamic application security. Uh, this is also known as black box testing, that hey, there's a website out there. I don't know what it was written in. I don't know any of the source code. All I see are web pages. How do I hack that? Um, and so what these do, uh, these scanners, what they'll do typically is they will crawl your website, spider it, discover everything on it, and then start attacking all of the inputs. 
okay, or looking for you know PHP info.php or an admin page, um, web stats, things that shouldn't be left on your server. Uh, it's going to poke on every input. Like if there's a form like username and password, it's going to try different attacks to try to force cross-site scripting, SQL injection, command injection. Um, so that's what's referred to as black box testing because we don't know what's behind the scenes, but we can try to trip it up by sending malicious attacks against that server. Uh, a couple of the big uh, names in that category, Zap is actually a free tool uh, that anyone can use. Uh, WebInspect, AppScan, NetSparker are paid offerings, but they all do the same thing as well. Kind of the downside with this is it's slow. It takes a long, if you can imagine, I'm going to run this tool against Amazon. How long is that crawl going to take to spider through that website, right? Um, it takes a long time. So uh, it also hammers the site. We're going to send thousands and thousands of crafted attacks against the server to try to get it to throw a vulnerability. Uh, so it's very chatty, if you will, uh, and slow. Sometimes it's hard to configure too. False positives are pretty rampant with these where, you know, it'll say, hey, you're vulnerable to SQL injection. And then somebody looks at it, and the developer's like, no, nah, this, this isn't right. It's not SQL injection. That, that can happen from time to time. Uh, so false positives are also a challenge. That kind of wraps up the presentation portion. I'll just leave it open to questions around this or anything around web application security. If it's something I don't know, I'll just make up an answer if it's outside of that realm. <laughs> Uh, but uh, welcome to hear anything from me. Is that on? <laughs> That's feedback. Rock and roll. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so. There's a number of things, but like the first, the most recent, the last thing that came to mind was, um, so the, I know this is not clearly a demo and if you're putting the ideal circumstances to make your point, mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to, uh, just general sysadmin and setting up any type of application that gets exposed to the world, proper hygiene is important and a non-trivial amount of problems that people encounter are permission based. Mm -hmm. So. I could see in the case of this example, if the piece of software that's running is running as a user that doesn't have write privileges to any of the files that you're just showing and necessarily couldn't see into any, it was restricted to only the directories that it had files that it needed access to, which would be the appropriate way to build that application and to set it up, this attack wouldn't work. Correct. And you could still like LS things, but you just see, oh, there's an HTML file. Let me try to overwriting. You can't because you don't own it. Right. you could read it. Um, so there is a large percentage of this where it's like, well, they just didn't set up their site right. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, in the case of Log4j, when it was discovered, immediately there was a patch. And unlike a, a closed source piece of software where a company doesn't necessarily have an incentive to tell other users that, hey, we, we screwed up. And somebody like SolarWinds, the fact that we know somebody gained access to it, that's nice to know. But they may have never have said anything and just released a patch. And all their users would never have known that they had any issues. And I uh, completely agree with it. If you're using any type of open source software, that's Joe Schmo who has like, is like maybe two or three contributors to their project, absolutely you should never just blindly use something like that. But when you're dealing with like major open source projects where they have thousands of contributors, if somebody tries injecting malicious code, somebody who maintains that project, who reviews that code, will find that and will flag it and not allow it to be merged. Hopefully. Hopefully. Um, but you have, like I said, the, the major drawback to something that's closed source is just, you just will never know necessarily. Mm -hmm. Whereas open source, it's all public. Uh, so, I mean, obviously I, I might seem like I have strong opinions on, on, on open source software. Um, and I... I work as a software engineer, work in ad tech, and I've been doing it for almost 10 years now. Um, and everything we do is using open source software. Mm -hmm. And so like something like, like Harpley, 
that was a thing that we were concerned about, but we immediately patched it. I mean, we had to do it immediately. And you have the same problem with uh, kiosks that are still running Windows XP that are connected to the internet, or like as I mentioned when, when before everything started, like you might have a Google Nest, uh, sorry, a Nest product that is pre-Google that's never going to get patched and is connected to the internet. Correct. And you're completely exposed in your household to have a device that's compromised and now have somebody spying on your home network. So it's, I don't think it's clear cut to say that open source software is dangerous, necess- any more oh, dangerous yeah. oh, than, sure. than closed source. I personally lean to say that it's safer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, don't get me wrong. I am all about open source. I mean, I use it all the time. Uh, it's really just identifying risks, right? And, and what can we do to mitigate those risks? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if there was a question there. I'm sorry. Oh, it's fine. And and they're all valid points, right? Like you said, proper hygiene. Did they set up the Linux permissions properly? You know, that that, (laughs) to rely on that is is kind of scary, right? Not everyone does that. And Um, also the fact that if you're running it in a container, does a world of a benefit to help protect your system. Right. Especially if the database that's accessed is in a different container, uh, that they wouldn't necessarily gain the credentials to get into yeah, by it, gaining access to your web server. Sure, and it depends how they set up that networking, right? You know, it, depending how that the container network is set up, that you could jump container to container if once you get in there, right? And that's a whole nother aspect of security that's really ramping up is uh, containerized security, right? Where there's now vendors that only focus on are these containers really locked down? Are the permissions correct? Are the net, Is the network set up properly? Um, so there, that's definitely a new space that has been emerging. Uh, around container security specifically. Uh, but those are all very valid points and, and completely agree. And yeah, for sure, again, I'm all about open source. I love it. <laughs> Saves me a lot of time and effort. But, you know, it, it's more just about awareness and what we need to look for when we do utilize those libraries. Anyone else? <laughs> Maybe I can repeat. What was it the most? Say it again. I don't know if I have one that's unique as far as combination. Um, vulnerabilities are usually pretty straightforward. You know, if there's if there's a hole, you. I mean, uh, boy, I, I'm ex, I'm don't have one off the top of my head for sure. Um, I, I know there have been some rabbit holes with zero day exploits against like Microsoft uh, Windows where you do have to jump through 10 different hoops to be able to execute some kind of, uh, to be able to get into that. Um, but uh, that's a little bit outside of my realm where I deal with mostly just websites uh, and security. Uh, Stuxnet, that, man, one of my favorite stories. If, if you don't know about Stuxnet, why, on YouTube there's at least one or two documentaries that are very thorough and very good, but how we ruined Iran's nuclear program, right, via uh, a coordinated effort of some of some governments. One of them, we no one's ever come out and said, yeah, we did it. But we're pretty certain between uh, us and Israel that came out with this vulnerability. Um, the thing that fascinates me about that story uh, that I just thought was the coolest thing in the world is uh, in that uh, what they did is they messed up their centrifuges, okay? So they were enriching uranium, right? And there's a centrifuge. Spins around, probably see these at doctor's offices, but this is on a way bigger scale. But And they were able to hack the Siemens machines that control those, okay? Okay, that's cool. If it were me, I'd say, great, make them turn off, right? You know, stop it. Just wreck the machines. But they didn't do that. What they did was made little variances in it to where it would slow down, speed up, right? And it wasn't consistent, but the numbers all showed it was consistent. So time after time, their enriching was getting ruined. And they're looking at it going, what's going on here? I don't know, let's try it again. Nope, that one's bad too. And just chasing their tails, trying to figure out what was going on when all along it was this hack (laughs) that essentially messed up the centrifuges, not to break, but just to be sort of just a little bit off. (laughs) Uh, But it's a a great story uh, on that. So S-T-U-X-N-E-T, if you want to look that up. Anyone else?
So just to, I guess, piece together the first two questions, um, there's no reason that, I mean, the reason why this is kind of a big deal is that there's no, how is it? Sorry. It would be possible for someone to chain these vulnerabilities together, of course, to get access to something else on their network, right? Well, like in this example, Log4j, once I'm on the machine, then I could start, you know, trying to go to other servers, right, using different techniques and chain together things that way. This one technique got me onto the one server, right? I'm there. Now, for me to go around and start going around other servers within the network may need to use other techniques, right? Now we're looking at networking techniques to figure out how do I, you know, SSH into some other box uh, that's on the network. Um, so, I mean, you could use it chained with other things to start migrating through another, through the entire network, right, of, of some company, for instance. All right, it's just sort of like in relation to these uh, questions, like what's the most unique sort of, you know, chain of like vulnerabilities, saying that this could be the start, like this log for day could be the start for someone to get in somewhere and then use another vulnerability against uh, right. another, like a vulnerable, another vulnerable piece of software, because you have shell access, so you could... Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So, uh, but I haven't seen any, I don't know of any examples like that. I'm sure there are uh, maybe something good for the hacking 101 and 201 panels. 201. Oh, that's where we get really uh, nerdy. Late night. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, for sure. Anyone else? Yeah, the uh, 101 panel is tomorrow at 8.30, I think, you know, where you can, it's more about the culture of hacking and uh, uh, just trying to, uh, how do I get into it, for instance, you know, and you can ask questions, do hackers really wear hoodies all the time and work in the dark? <laughs> uh, so you can ask things like that. Uh, yes? Um, hold on a second. <laughs> Um, I want to bounce back to what I believe you were saying um, about the differences between uh, open source and proprietary software and I think that most of the stuff you've been describing is less of an issue with open source specifically than with incorporating other people's code in general uh, how do you mean what's in the in, in, in the sense of like if you're using a library you inherit the whatever bugs are in that library mm -hmm. regardless of whether it's open source or proprietary. oh for sure oh absolutely um, it's just much more frequently done with open source <laughs> code it, yeah you're okay fair yeah. point, fair the, point attack back there. <laughs> the attack surface is greater right so mm -hmm. if you have a proprietary piece of software in your organization you know maybe 20 different teams are using it but here we had a million people using log4j <laughs> So it just it's more of a threat surface that you get to, you know, attack. Now that I think of it, I didn't ask a question in there. I apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> you are forgiven. Uh, okay, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up. And uh, I'm hanging out, so uh, if anyone has any other questions, uh, and maybe we'll see you at Hacking 101 or 201 uh, tomorrow and Sunday. So feel free to come out. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>